Courtney, a product manager at GitHub working on the dependency graph. Our goal is to give you the dependency data you need to help keep your software secure. Today, we're going to be talking about software bills of materials, or SBOMs, which create an inventory of your software components. This inventory can help you with making decisions around your software security and risk. We're going to do a quick dive into what SBOMs are and why people are using them, and then look at how we can shift the idea of SBOMs from being a regulatory chore that some people have to making them an integrated part of your security practice that helps you consume open source software with confidence. The widespread use of open source packages is pretty much the biggest change in how we build software that we've seen in decades. 78% of code written in commercial code bases use is external components. And since those components rely on other components, you can have a fairly small project that has a pretty lengthy supply chain. And if you're relying on a package that is itself relying on a package that has a vulnerability, your entire project can be vulnerable. And this typically isn't good. So enter supply chain security. How do we secure the components and practices involved in creating and deploying software? We want to avoid supply chain compromises brought on by upstream vulnerabilities and protect against the risk of supply chain attacks. And SBOMs can play a key role in this process. Software bills and materials are an inventory of everything that your software uses. It's your supply chain summed up in a specific machine-readable format. They become more popular recently since there have been some regulatory requirements from different governments saying that you should have them. And as an industry, though, we're still in the early days of SBOM generation and usage. So we can anticipate a lot of maturity to come in this area, but there are some defined components that are included across SBOMs today. Your SBOM is a file that includes information on your dependencies. It's like asset management, tracking what we're using in a fact-gathering manner. It holds dependency versions and relationships to each other, their license data and more, typically in XML or JSON. These should get updated with each code change so you always have an accurate account of your dependencies. So even in this pretty nascent stage, they can still be foundational for bringing transparency into your project in a standardized way, both for you and for the people that use your software. And this can help build trust with your users too. But until you do anything with them, they're just files. So this all might sound very familiar to you, even if you're not familiar with SBOMs. If you've used GitHub's dependency graph, you know that it provides data on your dependencies, versions, and licenses. A lot of the information that would then be encoded in a particular format to create an SBOM. The utility of the data is here, though, regardless of what format it's in. So here we can start to think about the difference between producing SBOMs in a specific format, because we need to, and consuming them to get some insights from the data that they house. At their core, SBOMs give us transparency into our projects. And then we can make some decisions around what we're using. If you need to adhere to certain license policies or you don't want to be using dependencies that are deprecated and so on. But most interestingly, maybe, is that this info lets us answer questions in the wake of a security event. Like, am I affected by this vulnerability? And more importantly, where am I affected by this vulnerability? And this leads you to identifying how risky that particular vulnerability is and how to prioritize it. SBOMs are not a security panacea by any means, but they can be a foundational layer where further security practices can be built. They don't always contain vulnerability data, but when we take an SBOM and couple the dependency data with up-to-date, actionable vulnerability data, we can turn SBOMs into more than the sum of their parts. We don't want to add a ton of extra work for people. We just want to get the advantages of SBOMs in the easiest way we can. With GitHub, we can incorporate both their production and consumption into some existing processes and tools to bring the information to where you're working. With a medley of GitHub Actions, the Dependency Graph, the Advisory Database, and Dependabot, we can generate SBOMs and put them to use in your security practice. Your comprehensive list of dependencies is matched with a comprehensive advisory database. GitHub is the second largest CVE numbering authority. And you can receive alerts on any known vulnerabilities that may be lurking in your software. The key part of this workflow is the Dependency Graph's Dependency Submission API. We talked earlier about how the Dependency Graph gives you pretty much the same data that SBOMs do, but by default, the Dependency Graph can only do this comprehensively for certain ecosystems, ones that have manifest files that contain all the project's dependencies that are simple to parse. For ecosystems where it's difficult to detect all the dependencies, like when they're resolved at build time, we have the Submission API, a route for you to upload dependencies for any ecosystem or upload SBOMs. And then they're in your supply chain security workflow and you're off to the races. So all those steps may seem like a lot of work, but it's mostly a set it and forget it operation. 
So let's see what it looks like. So here we have a fairly simple Maven repository. Maven uses a POMXML to list the project's dependencies, but these don't include transitive dependencies. So it's easy to miss things like log4j when they're being pulled into your application. We can use an SBOM tool to catch everything inside this repo and then upload it to the repository's dependency graph. And we can start with GitHub Actions. So I have this workflow file that generates and updates an SBOM. This uses Anchor's SIF tool for generating software bill of materials from container images and file systems. Down here, we're building the project with Maven, which is the basis for the SBOM and gives us an accurate view of what dependencies are actually being included when the project is built. Build time detection of dependencies. We're using Anchor's SBOM action, which leverages SIFT to produce an SBOM in the SPDX format. It'll use the jar file from the build. And then, behind the scenes, it's transposing the SPDX format into the snapshot format we need for the dependency submission API, and then it's uploading that SBOM to the dependency graph. Note that this workflow happens on push, so we're always getting the latest representation of the repository. So this all happens relatively quickly. Once we set up the workflow file, we're good to go. Let's go to the dependency graph and see how we're consuming this SBOM. We can see the dependencies defined in the POM XML that dependency graph scans automatically, and we have detected one vulnerability. When we scroll down, we can see the dependencies that are pulled out of that SBOM. These are the dependencies associated with the jar file, and they look a bit different from the default scan of the POM XML. It's a more accurate view with build time detection, and since Dependabot kicks in automatically once we've uploaded the SBOM, we see a few more vulnerable dependencies that didn't pop up before. We link dependencies back to their GitHub repositories. So beyond vulnerabilities, we can access more information about them that's interesting for us to know. We can see the number of stars and forks of the dependency, when it was last updated and such, which is helpful to detect if we're using something that's typo squatting or has been deprecated and gives us more fodder for making decisions on how we can manage our dependencies. So that's the SBOM consumption side. Let's pop over back to the production side and take a look at the workflow artifacts. We can access the SBOM that was created in our workflow run, download it, and take a peek inside to see what an SBOM file actually looks like. So we have some information on the supplier name, Anchor, information on our packages, their name, some external identifiers like pearls, and the version number. Again, you know, it's a JSON file, not necessarily the most interesting thing for humans, but when we embed it within our existing security processes, we end up getting more information, like these Dependabot alerts, in a familiar way. So the key here is that files by themselves don't really mean a whole lot. It's how we use them that makes them have any utility, and when we make them easy to generate, explore, and plug them into existing vulnerability management processes, they can help drive better, more reliable security outcomes. Some things to leave you with. We showed one action that submits SBOMs to the dependency graph, but there are other actions for you to explore, both for generating and submitting SBOMs and for submitting dependencies for other ecosystems that are not supported out of the box. The demo repo we use today is available for you as well, and this includes some reference links on the dependency graph and the dependency submission API, links to various SBOM generator tools, and a couple actions that will upload SBOMs of different formats to the dependency graph. We encourage you to try it out, and as always, let us know how it goes. Thank you.